coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Searching for Bluetooth-enabled devices. Searching for Bluetooth-enabled devices. Found Nintendo Switch. It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with ya. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. My name is Patrick Ellers, and I am joined, as I'm always joined, by my co-host, Mark Mitchell. We've got a good show for you today. We're going to be talking about the news from the week, including Bluetooth support currently being on your Nintendo Switch. And then on Thursday, we ponder the question, Nintendo, what if? But Mark, in the meantime, how you doing? I'm doing great, Patrick. I don't know about you, but I am ready for autumn. Oh, yeah, I'm ready for fall. I'm ready... Yeah. For the jackets, I'm ready for mm-hmm. um, the slightly cooler weather. Um, I'm ready. I'm bring it on. I'm ready for all of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, over the weekend, Mark, <laughs> I wore a flannel over a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm ready too, man. You're ready. Uh, uh, g- give me those layers. Give me a, uh, you know, give me a day where I can't wear shorts because it's just a little too breezy. You know, like I'm just. I'm I'm there. I I want it. I want to ride my bike to work and not be sweaty when I get there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm into it. It's hard because like mentally I'm there, and so every day I throw off the sheets and I'm like, all right, let's do this. Right, it's time for yeah. cool weather. It is right. of course time not at s- all the time. Scarfs for. and snow pants. Yes, yes. <laughs> I really can't wait. I we um my husband and I recently moved to a new neighborhood. Um, and we uh our neighbors have been very friendly, but they have been going out of their way to warn us that our neighborhood apparently gets tons and tons of trick-or-treaters at Halloween. And I've never, I've I've lived in apartments um, the entire time I've been in LA and I've never encountered a trick-or-treater. And so uh, I, I, I I don't know, like, I don't really know how to prepare for this. Oh, uh, Mark, it's easy. It's candy. You just get candy. <laughs> no, I think we're going to be floss and toothbrush people. No, no, Mark, you can't possibly. <laughs> I mean, I, I wonder what is, because like there is, you know, obviously uh, you love candy. I love candy. We're mm-hmm. candy boys. Mm-hmm. Like we're on the record as uh, candy lo- loving candy. Boys. That's right. <laughs> Giving out candy. Eating it too. Um, But like, I wonder what the like responsible what like the reasonable adult does i think you just fold and just like give out candy (laughs) i think oh i think so too i think um in if apparently in a a neighborhood where like halloween trick-or-treating is a big deal it feels like painting a big old target on our backs if we don't don't. uh if we don't have candy of some sort yeah yeah no that 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 tracks for me mark uh speaking of ways to paint a big old target on your back the sonic forces borrowing program (laughs) would you like to borrow my copy of sonic forces all you gotta do is email us at nintendo cartridge society at at gmail.com give us a mailing address and i promise that we will not uh paint a big old target on the place that we are mailing this copy of sonic forces to um you get to play the game for as long as you want you send it back it doesn't cost you anything there may be a copy of untitled goose game in there which i guess is its own way of having a target painted on your back the goose will harass you uh, you can play that game for as long as you want and then send it back to me. Patrick, do we know where these games are right now? Uh, I know that one of them is back with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I believe the other one... I don't remember. <laughs> no, but <laughs> it's it's, it's always yeah. an exciting time when a game makes it back to you. It's like the um, yeah. Swallows to Capistrano. It's like it still works. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, like, the geese back to Anna Paquin, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing you can do is you can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, leaving a f- Really sharing the show any way that you can helps us out a ton. It helps yeah. people find the show, helps grow this big old society we call the Nintendo Cartridge Society. And uh, yeah, if you do leave us a five-star review in the U.S. Apple Podcast Store, we check those, and so we would, we'll would give you a shout-out on the show. If you leave us a review anywhere else, definitely let us know. You can hit us up on Twitter. You can send us an email. We would love to give you a shout-out, but the only place we check is the U.S. Apple Podcast Store. So thank you to everyone who has ever left us a review or recommended the show to your friends. 
um, that we really appreciate it. Yeah, or even if you've just engaged with us on Twitter, um, which actually brings us to a tweet that we got from the Nintendo Pals podcast. Uh, they tweeted at us uh, uh, about our WarioWare character rankings, which if you have not listened to, I uh, recommend checking it out. It was a fun episode. Uh, they write, fantastic episode as always. One thing I wanted to know, how did Wario become friends with all these people? It's never explained. Also, where's Waluigi? Um, which is a good question. Yeah, I feel like addressing the Waluigi piece first. Okay, I yeah. think Wario and Waluigi are not actually friends. Because Waluigi, I think, is a poser, right? Like, he is not mm. an actual Mario brother. He's not even a right. Wario type. He's just, like, someone who wants in on the game. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, like, I think the fact that he, like, made himself Wario's, you know, tennis doubles partner... Uh, is because he saw an obvious hole, right? Uh, right? Which is actually going to address um, the first part of the question, is that he saw that Wario, indeed and in truth, has no friend, right? That no one can stand this man, and he's like, this is it, this is my ticket in. I just pretend to be Wario-esque, and now I'm in Mario tennis. Now, I, um, I thought this was a great question, because, and it got me thinking, like, because in the WarioWare games, I... I I don't know that I would go so far as to call, like, the people in Diamond City, like, the other characters in Mario are, like, friends with Wario. But it is, like, a plot point and part of the character description of multiple characters that they are, like, obsessed with Wario. And Wario is a big, fat loser. And so the fact... It makes me think that maybe Diamond City only exists in Wario's mind. Like, I don't know that this actually exists. This all might just be, like, a Wario's projection or Wario's dream. Because sure. I, I, I really, I don't know that anybody can stand Wario. Well, okay, so the, the theory that I put forth uh, in response to this uh, tweet on Twitter was that uh, no one, none of these characters are his friends. They are, in fact, his employees mm. slash people who want to make games with him because they all do work for WarioWare Incorporated. And Wario, uh, while a frustrating person to work with, is also a full-time treasure hunter and therefore <laughs> has the means to fund development of whatever kind of video game they want to work on. I feel like any, I mean, I think that's a really, that's a really good point that maybe they're just, uh, they're not really friends. They just see an opportunity. Everybody's just using each other in diamond city. Right. 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 I mean, it's, it's a doggy dog world. I mean, you and I have lived in cities for, you know, the majority of our lives. Like we know it's tough out there. (laughs) You find someone with resources. You just like attach yourself to them. You find a treasure hunter. You like you barnacle onto that treasure hunter, no matter what, no matter if they pick their nose in public, no matter if they mm-hmm. rudely drive a motorcycle all around town. I don't know. I I I think, uh, I I suspect that Diamond City is a construct of like Wario's addled brain. Yeah, I mean, I, th- this is also very compelling, especially because, and maybe the most compelling like data point here is that we have never seen any other Mario character interact with Diamond City or the residents of Diamond City. Mm-hmm. And right, it's the fight club yeah. thing where it's like, you know, uh, all of Wario's friends get on the bus and only he pays. And you're <laughs> like, okay, only one of these characters truly exists. The clues were there all along. We just had to look for them. Truly. Um, oh, well, one last thing is that October, before, one last thing before we get into the meat of the show here, uh, is that October is Game & Watch month. Um, we are very excited to be discussing Game & Watch for the majority of October. Um, uh, we are going in a little bit blind. We are learning a lot already. Um, but if you have anything, any points of interest that you want us to uh, highlight or any observations about Game & Watch, email them to us, Nintendo Cartridge Society at, at gmail.com. gmail.com. And be part of it. Um, candidly, we've already recorded one episode for uh, Game & Watch Month. And let me tell you, it's a banger. We're giving you good episodes for October. I'm very excited about uh, the rest of it as it develops, but we will talk about it when we get to October. Mark, are you ready to get into what we've been playing? Yeah, let's do it. A couple big releases last week. Big, and when I say big releases, I mean like big indie releases, right? Um, Skatebird came out, Eastward came out, and Toem came out. Um, I picked up both Toem and Eastward, uh, and I decided to put Toem on first, 
uh, which means that I spent all weekend playing and beating Toem. Now, remind me again, Toem, it, the black and white like photography game, is that right? Yes. Okay, so explain uh, it to me a little yeah. bit more. Okay, so the, the way Toem works is that you are in these, uh, uh, you, you start off in your hometown, uh, and it's like a single like diorama that you, you know, rotate around, um, Captain Toad style, and uh, you pull up the camera, at which point it goes into a first person perspective, uh, and you take pictures of things. Um, and uh, sometimes people want you to take pictures of stuff, sometimes they uh, have sort of uh, roundabout ways of asking you to take pictures of things, like they want to be inspired by something or, you know, whatever. Um, and you have like a, a little card a little like neighborhood community card that when you fulfill enough requests, you can move on to the next area via bus. Um, and there are four, uh, there's the, the home area. And then there are, uh, you, yeah, at, at the beginning of the game, you are uh, setting out so you can go experience the world um, and witness a, a natural phenomenon called Toem. Um, and that, that's at the, uh, you, you start in uh, world one, Toem is world six. Um, and those are both like sort of single screen diorama experiences. Um, but the four worlds in between them are like sewn together from multiple dioramas. Um, and you're just sort of going around meeting characters and addressing their needs and taking pictures of stuff. Um, it's very uh, simple. It's very chill. The music rules. Um, you're, you, uh, you have a little Walkman like device that they call a hike lady. Um, which is, is very funny. Um, and uh, so every time you encounter new music, you also have the ability to play it, you know, like as, as you're walking around. Um, and, uh, you know, like kind of that's it. There's some like rudimentary um, puzzle solving. Uh, and um, like there are some things that, you know, just like a couple puzzles here and there that kind of break out of um, the self-contained world where like you have to go into other worlds to get information or photographs to bring back to other worlds. Um, but generally speaking, it's like a laid back, um, fun, chill experience. And uh, when I got to the end and actually experienced uh, Toem, I was like, oh, yeah, this is uh, novel and shocking and um, like fun. Um, and it was worth getting to it. And every step along the way, like it's weird to say that it was worth getting to it when every step was fun, you know. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I played through Toem, uh, loved it. it, took me about four and a half hours to get all the way through um with uh you know uh 100% completion and I, I i loved it thought it was a great game that sounds really nice it's very nice it reminded me a lot of um a short hike um oh, okay. which came to switch earlier this year um except uh like a, a short hike had a lot of the similar like they're just like characters on this island that have like little problems that want you they want you to address um but the sort of like main hook behind uh, a short hike was like sort of 3D platforming, mm -hmm. uh, and the hook the hook here is just photography instead. How much? How much was Tom? I think it's twenty bucks, maybe. Yeah, that which sounds is a, just like a really yeah. like pleasant experience. Yeah, it's it's totally charming. Uh, the the writing is really good. Um, I I laughed out loud a couple times while playing. Um, and yeah, it's just it's uh, there, there's so many like fun little circular uh logic things um there, there's one puzzle in the third world where um so i guess i'm going to spoil the solution to one puzzle here but uh, so forgive me um where there's uh you meet a, a a fisherman who is scared of a giant fish that he saw um and he wants a picture of the fish so he can confront it right um and he's whistling a tune and you can take a picture of the music that he's whistling and show that to someone who is uh, thinking, who wants to whistle, but doesn't have a tune. And then he starts whistling the tune. And then you take him to someone who is playing guitar next to a giant fish. And like, you, you like That's have fun. to, you put all these like people and pieces together. Um, and then you can end up using the old man's tune uh, to show him a picture of the fish that uh, scared him so much uh, in, initially. Um, and it's just, it's that like feeling of interconnectivity and like, you know, a, a living little world there that's just so uh, charming and fun. I played a, a couple of games this past week, a little bit of a grab bag. So Tetris 99 was having a Tetris Maximus Cup for that had a WarioWare Get It Together theme. Yeah. So knocked that one out. I, um, on the scale of like 
good themes to bad themes that have come to Tetris 99. You know, there haven't been any like truly awful ones, but some I enjoy more than others. For me, the uh, pinnacle so far has been the Splatoon 2 theme. I really oh, like that one so a lot. Good. Yeah. And so I, I would say this one was somewhere in the middle. It's uh, pretty good. I feel like the, the beginning music when you're in like the uh, 99 to 50 is not that good, but like it, once you get to 50 players yeah, left, it, to get it really like kicks yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I found it uh, the each block of the Tetraminos has a character face on it. Um, so I found it a little like visually busy to look at. Um, and so like it just, you know, I, I, I really look forward to the like the shorthand of um, seeing like the color and like the vague shape of the piece and knowing exactly what it is um, and just having you know, four faces on every piece makes it a little bit harder for me to latch onto. But yeah, the, the music in the background, I thought were really good. I also played uh, more of WarioWare, Get It Together. Not a whole lot more to say about the game, but just having a good time with it. One thing I thought was interesting was the uh, end credits. So there's like the staff credits that you can choose to launch. And um, it is both interesting and novel the way that the staff credits work where every character has an opportunity um, on the screen. And so the credits show up and then you use the player's ability or the character's ability to like push the credits off the screen. And yeah. once you clear a screen, then more credits appear. So I thought that was a fun, like cool way to do that. It just went on too long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's credits for a, a modern video game, right? Yeah. So they're, they just are too long. There are too many people that work on these things. <laughs> But um, yeah, having fun with WarioWare, get it together. And then finally, putting some more time into The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Still slowly plugging my way through it, but enjoying it quite a bit. I finished up the Elden Volcano, the Earth Temple. Um, and really, like the, te the temple, at least the ones that I've encountered so far, the temples are not that long and not like yeah. overly complex, which I am actually appreciating, um, where I have to do like a little bit of like thinking like where to go next, but haven't really been stumped so far. Uh, I continue to be kind of, like, uh, impressed with the story of Skyward Sword at this point. Um, it was not something that I have ever really valued in a Zelda game all that much, and it was not something that I was really anticipating enjoying so much in Skyward Sword. But, uh, I get you're a spoiler alert for The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword, so if you don't want to hear this, just skip ahead a little bit. But at the end of the Elden uh, Volcano, at the end of the Earth Temple, there's, you encounter, because up to this point, you've been, like, trying to find Princess Zelda, and you, you do, you run into, you find Princess Zelda at the end of the temple, and she's with this kind of, like, mysterious figure, and yeah. the mysterious figure has her go ahead into this other, like, realm or whatever, and then Link tries to follow, and the mysterious figure's like, no. As, you know, they're like, hey, like, you were late. You, like, if, yep. if you are intending to truly be the hero, you need to step up your game. Because if I wasn't here, Zelda would be dead, essentially. Yeah. And I, I thought it was just an, it's an interesting, um, I don't know. It, 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 nobody has ever, like, verbalized that in a Zelda game before. You know, yeah, like, it's, uh, it, it makes the stakes feel more real. I, I'm just really enjoying the interactions between the characters way more than I ever have before. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of that uh, stems from like taking the sort of conceit of like the the legendary hero that like you are the uh, the reincarnation of the legendary hero, or are you the hero? You know, are are you this hero? Um, taking that conceit seriously, because like I feel like in in most Zelda games, uh, it's not really a question. They're just like, oh, you are this. Yeah. Um, and in Skyward Sword, you are constantly being tested on it. Um. And you, uh, you know, seemingly are failing at it for a, a, a lot of it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I wanted to get back to uh, Skyward Sword this weekend, but man, the siren song of, of Tom was just too much. Um, I, yeah, it's, uh, man, what, what a good game. How, how did you like that, uh, the boss at the end of the Earth Temple, the, that like big uh, dragon thing? Yeah, I thought it was fun. It, um, I like that it was, a different setup than you yeah. know like other zelda game bosses that i've encountered before so basically it's like this dragon that's kind of like a big fireball with legs and <laughs> you know uh the um 
not momentum. One of my stamina. That like Link's Link has a, in Skyward Sword has only a certain amount of stamina, very similar to what we would later see in Breath of the Wild. And so there's this point where um, the basically the way the boss works is this uh, dragon thing will like run up, chases Link up a in, an incline, and so Link runs out of stamina really quickly. And um, at the top of the incline are some bombs. And so when the this uh, fire like ball thing, fire dragon like runs up high enough, it hits the bomb, explodes, rolls all the way back down. So then Link has to use his stamina. You have to like meter your stamina correctly yeah. so that way because you have to run all the way back down to where it is, throw a bomb into its gaping mouth, and then hit hit a glowing eye with a sword. So it's not all entirely novel for a Zelda boss. But yeah, I, I thought it was just an interesting spin and that, that really like the difficult part of it was making sure that you were conserving your stamina so you could use yeah. it in the appropriate places. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it's so it's similar to a Dodongo fight, right? Which is what you would expect of the uh, Fire Temple boss and of the second uh, you know, dungeon boss is a Dodongo. You got to put a bomb in its mouth. Um, and it is like in some ways superficially similar to that, but it is different enough and dynamic enough that like, it doesn't feel like retrotting old old ground. It feels like genuinely new. Yeah, and I kind of felt that way about the entire dungeon. Like again, yeah. it, it it really wasn't that complex, but being able to like run around on that little ball thing, yeah, um, super fun. Right? Yeah, just like uh, a fun spin on movement in that game. Um, we will continue to update you uh, with our uh, progress on the Legend of Zelda: Skyward Sword. But Mark. Those are the games that we've been playing this week. Let's get into the new releases and what we might be playing next week. Tomorrow, Wednesday, September 22nd, Pokemon Unite is released for mobile. The game has been out on Switch for a while now, but is making its mobile debut. I think I read somewhere that it had been downloaded like 9 million times, 6 million times, yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's what I read too. I think, I think it's 9. <laughs> a lot of million times, yeah. And I'm yeah. fairly confident that you're able to sync your progress from Switch to mobile and vice versa. So Yes, I saw an article uh, telling you how to do that, so it must be true. And then on Thursday, September 23rd, uh, Diablo 2 Resurrected is released, and also Fisty Fluffs is released on the Switch eShop. Yeah, Fisty Fluffs is a, a game that we saw in one of the Nintendo Directs, or one of the indie showcases, but that's just like uh, cats fighting each other. That's right. That's right. And then uh, on Friday, September 24th, Dragon Ball Z Karaka, uh, Kakarot. There we go. Kakarot. Uh, a new Power Awaken set is released on Switch. Uh, now, Mark, did you just reveal here on this show that you didn't watch Dragon Ball Z uh, in <laughs> junior high school on Adult Swim? I have, some, I have seen some Dragon Ball Z. Or Toonami, Z. I guess. Yeah, I've mm. seen some Dragon Ball Z, but clearly not enough to know what uh, whatever this thing is is kakarot kakarot <laughs> kakarot is uh goku's um saiyan name oh yeah nope didn't know that it's like calling a game uh like superman colon uh kal-el <laughs> got it oh that's it Ooh, that's a good name nobody steal that yeah no one steal that i, I, I like it too much uh a anything on on this list of uh games coming out uh, appeal to you mark you know, I um, I don't know. Before the events of this summer, I was interested in Diablo 2 Resurrected. But with everything going on with Activision Blizzard now, I think for me personally, I'm pass. I'm going to yeah. pass on it. Um, but uh, it, it did definitely hold some appeal to me, for sure. Yeah, but, uh, you know, forget those guys. They're uh, bad, shady business practices and uh, abusing people and all that awful stuff. Um, so Activision Blizzard, uh, needs to get their stuff together. Yep. yep. Uh, and, uh, just be better. Uh, and in the meantime, we will, uh, you know, just kind of not dig their stuff. Okay. Um, Mark, those are the new releases. Let's close out this segment. Which brings us to a regular segment on our show. It is time for 433. In 1952, American composer John Cage wrote a piece called 433. We're in a performer or group of performers didn't play their instruments for four minutes and 33 seconds. For the purposes of this show, our instruments are talking about Nintendo. So for the duration of one performance, 433, Mark and I will talk about something not at all Nintendo related, thus fulfilling the contract of the piece. Uh, Mark, today we are discussing the Dan Brown classic, <laughs> The Da Vinci Code. 
So, so the Da Vinci Code was a uh, novel. It is uh, has since been turned into a movie, but it was a novel, and uh, I think it came out in like two thousand three. That, that sounds right. Um, just kind of like blew up. It was it was huge. It was like an enormous bestseller, and I read it. Did you did you ever read the Da Vinci Code, Patrick? I did not read the Da Vinci okay. Code. Have you ever seen the movie? I have seen the movie. I saw Tom Hanks's hair in that movie. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and like, you know, I, I knew people around me that were reading The Da Vinci Code, um, but it was just one of those things where, like, I mean, it, it came out slash, like, rose to popularity while I was in college, um, and so much of, uh, like, entertainment and, like, you know, it was sort of as I was taking, like, time off from games, too. Like, I just wasn't uh, committing too much time to anything that was, you know, more... Um, time intensive than like a TV show or a, a, a movie or something. No. Oh yeah, I think th- that makes total sense. Um, yeah, it it's at the time it was an enormous success. My memory is that it was also like controversial. Maybe I I feel like it has something to do with um uh actually I should just I should just pull up the Wikipedia so I don't have to guess because I think it is um okay. I think it was controversial because it talks about the possibility of like Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene having a kid together or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, not just the possibility. It, it the book posits that uh, one of the characters is a descendant from Christ. Oh, okay, okay. Well, then yeah. there we go. So, anyways, um, yeah. So it was like hugely successful, hugely controversial. It sold like sixty million copies. But the thing that I'm curious to get your thoughts on, Patrick, is like. When things like this blow up to the degree that it did, yeah. like how does that happen? Why did it, why did everybody catch Da Vinci Code fever? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of the same thing as like Hunger Games, right? And in both of these examples, these are things that like blew up and were really, really big for the you know a a brief period, and like have sort of no lasting place in our collective consciousness, right? Right. Like, Hunger Games maybe a little bit more because like it's easy to be like. Oh, you know, I, uh, we're uh, we're living in the Hunger Games. Uh, it's like the capital. <laughs> it is yeah, easy. I, it is easy to be like that. That is easy. That is easy to be like that. Um, but like, yeah, I I don't know why uh the Da Vinci Code like hit, and then why it was so. I did one thing that the Da Vinci Code uh felt like to me is that it felt like a Michael Crichton style oh totally like, novel where it was like giving you all this information in like short punchy chapters. And like that was its hook. Is that like you got to feel like you were learning something about something while um, reading the story? I think that that's a really good point. Did you? I, I can't remember. A few years ago, I tried to re- reread the Lost World, uh, the sequel to Jurassic Park. Yeah. Um, the Michael Crichton wrote, and I, cause I remember I had not read it since it was released. So I was like a kid when it came out, and I remember thinking it was pretty good. And I tried to reread it, and it was I couldn't I couldn't finish it. I thought it was so bad like every single character in that is just like some awful exposition machine yes <laughs> it's so it was it was it was so weird to like go back and um reread it having a been in, like thinking that i was going to enjoy it a lot i do wonder uh i don't think that i would ever go back and reread the da vinci code i don't remember liking it that much when i read it the first time but i do i now that we're talking about it i'm, I'm almost like curious i i peacock has well that's uh that's the applause mark so we'll never know what oh we'll peacock, never know for sure what we'll never know what peacock has uh we were accompanied today by berliner phil harmoniker all right mark let's get into the news last week nintendo pushed a firmware update for the nintendo switch that enables bluetooth audio after all this time um the Bluetooth connection is limited to one device at a time, and while the Switch is connected to audio, only two controllers can be paired with it. Uh, Mark, this is nuts. Uh, a Bluetooth audio functionality is something that I obsessively bring up when we talk about like Switch hardware revisions. Um, and who knew that it didn't take a hardware revision? It just took uh software yeah i never would have guessed because i remember when the switch oled was announced and the fact that like bluetooth audio wasn't part of that upgrade 
was a little bit was just interesting. And then it's like they did one better. You don't have to get a Switch OLED model in order to have Bluetooth audio now. You just have to update your Switch. Kind of crazy that it took um, just a software update, but that we're getting it now in 2021. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I and I, I think like from experimenting with it, I've I've paired my headphones um, with with my switch, and you know we uh, made the note already that you can only pair um, two controllers with your switch while while you are um, connected with Bluetooth audio. I I, I obviously uh, the Joy Cons also connect via Bluetooth, right? Um, so there must just be an amount of bandwidth that they're comfortable committing to uh, Bluetooth audio. Um, versus the other like Bluetooth connections, um, and you know, uh, there's Bluetooth uh, is always like a- audio. There's always going to be a, like a little bit of a lag. Um, I couldn't tell if it was more pronounced um, with with the switch or if that was just in my head. Um, but it seems like it is not the snappiest. You know, for for whatever reason, it's not optimized for that. Yeah. Uh, and like it can do it, which is good, and I'm glad that we have that option now. But it's maybe not the ideal way to uh, play your Switch with headphones. I think, yeah, I think you're onto something there, Patrick, because I, I think the way that this was just kind of like in an update that they tweeted yeah. about, but, you know, like, uh, weren't hailing it as like a big, you know, new, important new feature or anything like that. Um, Yeah, I, I think you're right that they're just kind of like slipping it in there because it is possible and kind of maybe like a tactic admission that it's not the most amazing Bluetooth audio experience but it can be done now which is really interesting yeah well i mean you just think of the number of times that you like are in a situation where you like want to play your switch um you know not at home like you're out in the world somewhere uh and all you have with you are your bluetooth headphones like you know pretty pretty common like you know we've have in a lot of ways have migrated away from having uh corded um headphones especially while you're out right um so yeah it's just nice to be able to uh to to do that now well especially because the most recent pair of like i feel like a, for a lot of people when you get a new phone is when you get new yeah. like headphones and uh i mean i guess apple doesn't even put headphones in there anymore but when they did the most recent time like they've been lightning connectors right like they weren't even right. just regular um you you couldn't use them in your switch so i haven't owned a pair of headphones that like work in the switch for a really long time so nice to have this there yeah even if it's not the most optimal experience speaking of things that shouldn't have been that way in the first place really but you can now tweet from your switch using the full 280 characters instead of being limited to 140 characters which years ago was the twitter limit and yeah has not been that way for many years at this point, but Nintendo continued to just use the original 140 character limit. So, however, now with this update, you get the full 280 characters. It's such a small thing, uh, and it takes so long to type stuff out on the Switch, like using a (laughs) controller anyway. Um, But it's good. That's that's a good change. I'm I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, frees you up to um, tweet screenshots with a little bit more commentary. Also included in the update is an update dock feature that you can find in settings. Though, if you're using an OG Switch, it doesn't do anything. It'll only work with the OLED version's dock with the built-in Ethernet connection. Yeah, which implies that it won't be updating that much or anything really substantial. It's just like if there's anything that they need to, you know, patch about the way it connects via Ethernet that they have the ability to. Um, yeah, it... it 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 doesn't mean that the switch will ever be or that the dock will ever be able to like unlock something more about the the switch that's it's it's just not it it's going to it's a minor thing time for a little bit of speculation um nintendo has filed a game controller related application with the fcc that's the federal communications commission commission yeah there we go uh which has led to speculation consortium <laughs> Which has led to speculation that a new classic controller is coming to Switch. Um, Predominant among this speculation is the rumor that Nintendo 64 games will be coming to the Nintendo Switch online library. And similar to previous controllers that we've seen, like the Nintendo Entertainment System controller and the Super Nintendo controller that can, you charge, like they're Bluetooth controllers that you can charge by putting into the rails on your Nintendo Switch. 
Well, hold on a sec. That's only you only put the NES controllers in the rails. The uh, Super NES controllers uh, charge via um, USB C. Oh yes, that's right. And according to the FCC filing, this mysterious controller would also charge using USB C. Yes, and use the same batteries as the Super NES controller and the Joy-Con. So the reason why people think that this is a Switch controller is that the the controller filing is de- designated as HAC043 and the SNES controller for Switch was designated as HAC042. So HAC seems to be like the prefix for Switch accessories. Yeah. Um the Switch is not in the filing by name, but really what else could it be for? The filing itself cuz what happened last time that uh the SNES controller like kind of leaked beforehand. Basically they um uh, the paperwork that they filed did not show an SNES controller as such, but they have to show in these FCC filings where the like FCC um, required label is going to go. And they showed for the Super Nintendo controller, they showed it like on the back of what was obviously a Super Nintendo controller. Right. This time they're just showing like a bunch of uh, rectangles essentially. So we don't know exactly what it is. It's not as clear as last time. But the way that Nintendo filed this with the FCC is that it's supposed to be kept um, secret for 180 days, which means that basically any time in the next six months, you know, they could reveal what they're going to reveal. However, it was only a couple of weeks ago that rumors of a Game Boy and Game Boy Color games coming to Nintendo Switch Online uh, had us predicting the lineup for that. So there's this Game Boy rumor out there. There's this new Super Ni- or Nintendo 64 rumor out there. Patrick, what is your take on the state of the nation? I mean, it does seem like something's got to give here, right? Like we, um, the the rumors were that the uh, Game Boy and Game Boy Color games were going to come to the Nintendo Switch Online Library, but I feel like that was. That was almost more of an example, right? That was like new new classic libraries will be coming to the Switch like the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. Um, so like that's an easy one to glom onto. It sort of makes sense with like the timeline of what they've put out already. Um But, you know, if they compare it with a because I mean the, the the thing with the uh Game Boy library is that like how do you sell hardware with that, right? Like what kind of controllers can you sell um, along with it? But if you can sell Nintendo 64 controllers, and I don't actually know that you can. Like, I think you can, but, like, I don't know who's going to buy them. Um, like, that that becomes, like, more of an event-style thing, right? Oh, well, I mean, I know who would buy one. Me. I would absolutely 100% you would, you would buy Nintendo. You would buy one. I would 100% buy a Nintendo 64 controller if they sold one. Like, I love the novelty of the nes controller i love the novelty of the super nintendo controller i will if it turns out to be a nintendo 64 controller i would love the novelty of that you know uh part of the rumor that's floating around or at least um some speculation that's floating around is that we might see us right now nintendo switch online subscriptions are 20 bucks and you know a year a year and you know they're 20 bucks for everybody if you're buying an individual subscription. Now, the speculation is that Nintendo potentially is looking to split it into tiers, and so maybe only the higher tier would get Nintendo 64 games, and just as, like, an incentive to get people to upgrade. I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I buy the Nintendo 64 games are coming to Switch, but I would love it to be true. Yeah, I mean, the the thing that, to me, is, like, the ultimate tragedy of the Nintendo 64 is, like, you know, we we were talking uh, the other week when we were doing the, the Game Boy lineup that, like, look, I know they've never re-released uh, Game Boy Tetris, but if, they're, if you're doing a Game Boy library, Tetris has to be part of it. And I feel like that is true for the Nintendo 64 library with, like, a bunch of games that are just owned by, that are rare games, right? A- and further... Uh, one of which is rare and James Bond, right? <laughs> like, it's just uh, I I feel like there there are too many important and like crucial to the library games that there's no way Nintendo can put on 
the the service. I th- I I think that's a hundred percent true. But I think that it would be a shame if we didn't get like if that's what stopped them from putting Nintendo sixty four games yeah. on the system. It's like okay, yeah, you're not gonna be able to have Goldeneye. I mean, people complain at Nintendo on Twitter for everything, right? So right, like, right. you know, um, can't get Goldeneye. Okay, can't get Perfect Dark. Yep, probably not. But can't get Banjo Kazooie. Can't get Banjo Kazooie. And yet, does that should do I still want Star Fox sixty four? Do I still want the ability to play like to give Donkey Kong sixty four another chance? Like have Mario on it? I mean, yes, yeah. absolutely, a hundred percent. I definitely want the. What if there was a chance that like the Castlevania games for the Nintendo sixty four could be there? Oh, they're you know terrible I mean? though. They're terrible. They're so bad. Like, they're they're not. They are not great. But it's like yeah. I I feel like. Uh, I I hope that the fact that the library would probably be fairly limited, I hope that that doesn't stop them from doing this if it is a real thing. Because I would take the you know like the scraps that they are able to give us. I mean, there's yeah. there are notoriously the Nintendo sixty four um relied on first party games, you know, yes. for its library, and so there's a lot of stuff. Yoshi's Story, like there's a lot of stuff that could be on there. That, wave um, race yes ex- i mean uh, t- truly uh pilot wings that is would be worth having on there even if you're that means you're not going to get all the rare stuff or all of ocarina the, of like, time and majora's mask <laughs> yeah yeah like all the other like third party stuff i think it would be worth it for even just nintendo's own first party titles yeah and like it, that it Yes, it would still be very cool, and there's still a lot of games in there that I would want to play. It does just feel like, uh, from the like, you know, fr- from the like, ah, oh, geez, it's it's just not gonna have yeah. like the one perfect thing. Yeah, um, is like is uh so- sort of unavoidable there. Also, you know, they worked out a deal in the Wii era for like Golden Eye ish thing to make its yeah, way to Wii. Yeah, that is true. So that is true. I don't think it's wholly impossible and nintendo and microsoft are seemingly or at least in the past were on fairly good terms so like if it was like sony stuff i think it would be a harder sell but i think it is at least feasible that you know things that are now controlled by microsoft could show up on a nintendo 64 online if that turned out to be a real thing yeah the the only reason that i'll push back on that is that uh microsoft does have a product called rare replay that has all of the the like old rare games uh, in it uh-huh. um and so like i think that would make them less likely to want to push those games out um, that's a good on, point on, on i forgot platform. about that i totally forgot about that uh and of course uh i gotta shout out um diddy kong racing here another uh rare developed game um that is obviously owned by nintendo so like they would be able to put it out i think um, if they're able to put out Donkey Kong 64, they'd be able to put out uh, Diddy Kong Racing. So that in and of itself may be enough to uh, to make it work. Mark, if they do put out a Nintendo 64 uh, controller for Nintendo Switch, um, does it or does it not include a Rumble Pack? Ooh, my guess is it doesn't. It does not include Rumble because I. How are you supposed to play Star Fox then? <laughs> I. That's just my guess for like money. That they're yeah. not, or, or they're going to be, like, expensive. Um, I mean, not mm. that the D- Nintendo or Super Nintendo controllers were cheap by any means. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess maybe may- maybe they will. It-, it just seems like an expense that they would avoid if they could. Yeah. It's, uh, well, and it wasn't um, the, uh, doesn't uh, Ocarina, or maybe it's Majora's Mask, one of them uses the Rumble Pack as, like, a... Um, like a a a, a rump, like a stone that like alerts you when like something is near. Like it's an oh. item you have to equip. Um, and I guess there are like workarounds for that. But like I think, I think it's possible that like Rumble is just like built into the calculus here. Patrick, I realized that we neglected to mention the original Paper Mario game, and I would do terrible oh, yeah. things to get the yeah, original Paper Mario game point. playable on Switch. Now I'm really really hoping this is true um i tell you what if if the nintendo 64 controller has a rumble pack in it removable or not removable either way i'll buy one (laughs) (laughs) no rumble pack no sale that's that's my stance the castlevania advanced collection has been rated for in taiwan this time with platforms listed along with the rating and switch is on that list 
Um, the Castlevania Advanced Collection was originally rated in Australia a few months ago. Oh, in June. And so, um, you know, it was rated in June. We haven't heard anything. Here's a second listing in a different yeah. country. Um, we still have no idea what the Castlevania Advanced Collection might be. But Patrick, do you think this is a good time for us to discuss the possibility or lack of possibility of there being a N- Nintendo Direct in the coming weeks? Yeah, this is, uh, I think, the, the, the perfect queue up. Obviously, both the, um, the speculation about classic console and like new controllers uh, is like, they gotta, if they're going to do this, they got to announce it. And this usually happens in September. Um, and uh, with, with uh, also now information about this Castlevania Advanced Collection, it totally makes me think that we are nearing a Nintendo Direct. Um, and maybe there is no, you know, you and I have talked about this, that like, we know Nintendo's lineup through January, right? Like, um, we we know, and then like, we also know that Splatoon 2 is coming early next year. Like, I, I feel like we've, we don't, there there aren't, we don't think anyway, a bunch of surprises coming yeah. up for us, right? Um, but there are just enough like, little crumbs here and there service related collection related remaster related that it's like okay uh i do think it's possible that we get a nintendo direct and i think it's possible that we can get a nintendo direct this week mark i was looking back through our history um and the february direct um we recorded an episode on the the monday um that week of, of the direct did not know that there was going to be a direct we announced a different topic for that thursday's episode and then Tuesday morning, Nintendo was like, by the way, we're doing a Direct tomorrow. Um, and so we scrambled and we uh, did an episode about the Direct on Wednesday night for the Direct that aired that Wednesday. Um, so I'm, st- I'm just saying, a- on any Monday, when we record one of these things, we think we know what we're going to talk about on Thursday, but we don't always. Uh, it- it- they can drop these things with very little notice and sometimes even no notice. We went back through the Wikipedia and Nintendo, at least for the past five years, has had some sort of direct in September. Yeah, yeah. I I agree with you that I think it is possible that we get a like a uh, direct mini. Because Ooh, hedge in, hedge yeah, in your yeah. bets. Well, just because like uh, like you said, like Nintendo's rest of the year is pretty well defined and I don't really know that there's yeah. room for anything else. And so they could start talking about stuff in February, but if that's the case, why not just hold, you know, a direct in January after the holidays? But a direct mini, that feels more of in the groove of the stuff that's, you know, kind of in the air right now, where, okay, we're going to talk about these new systems or platforms potentially coming to Nintendo Switch Online. Here's like some yeah. third party stuff that's coming this holiday. Um, that feels more to me in the groove of, possibility yeah well and it's also like you know metroid dread is a huge release for them right that's a big game um and uh to like put any other big announcements out before that game comes out feels like not really what nintendo is about right they they usually like to have the board kind of cleared yeah um for for when they like oh you can save up to buy these other games um Ooh, shouldn't have purchased Metroid Dread so fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you know, also uh, uh, none of the none of the things that we think make sense uh, it, end up actually being true. So yeah, uh, they 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 could they could do a direct this week, and I'd be like, yep, makes perfect sense. They could hold a direct for three weeks until after Metroid Dread, and I'd be like, yep, that makes sense too. So there was another game rating. Uh, that popped up at, from the Brazil Advisory Rating Board, and it was for Alan Wake Remastered, a remake, a remaster of the Xbox 360 exclusive from 2010. And last week it was announced for PC, PlayStation, and Xbox platforms. Switch wasn't mentioned at all. It did show up in Switch did show up in the listing that the Brazil Advisory Rating Board has for Alan Wake Remastered, but mm. so we're putting that out there. And now here come the caveats where it's like, this is probably most likely just a mistake, right? Yeah, that, that's my guess. Yeah. And the only other thing I can think of is that if it's not a mistake, it's potentially a cloud version, which we've seen a few of those um, from third parties on Switch. So 
maybe, but this feels like just like somebody was typing all of the current platforms right and um just forgot to remove switch yeah i mean i i i I think probably mistake although i mean i i don't know how um how the cloud versions of games do on switch like i I don't know if people are buying those or not um like uh you know we know guardians of the galaxy which is coming out in um october um, is going to have a, a cloud version on Switch, which was a surprise to us when we saw it um, at uh, the E3 Direct. Um, but, like, I don't know. Like, to my mind, it's like, why why would you play it there? Like, why wouldn't you play it on a, a system where you could actually... And I guess the, the answer is uh, because you only have the Switch, yeah. right? Yep. Um, but, uh, and, like, having the option to play it on Switch is nice, even if you have to be streaming it and therefore, like, tethered to your internet connection. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It is a, my, my guess here is this is a mistake. I mean, there are almost 100 million Switches out yeah. there in the world. Yeah. And so even if, like, yeah, I, I don't have any idea how the cloud versions of these perform. But even if, and I also have zero knowledge as to how difficult it is to create a cloud version of one of these games. But yeah. presuming that it is fairly simple or, like, um, fairly straightforward. You get what, like a hundred thousand people out of a hundred million, you know, to buy it, and like that's not bad depending on the amount of work that you have right. to do for it, right? So, yeah. the, the I, I guess what I'm saying is like the fact that we continue to see these trickle in, the fact that like Square Enix is going is making the effort to put Guardians of the Galaxy on the platform in a cloud version, yeah. like seems to me like it's not a complete waste of time. Well, and like beyond, you know beyond the uh the switch cloud version um you know there are other uh, lots of other like cloud streaming yeah, uh pl- platforms um did stadia fold or is it just like quiet now i think it's just quiet so i i, I think the, what, yeah i think they just don't have any like first party developers anymore and right they right. but i think they continue to support the service yeah, but so like there's Stadia, there's Luna, there's uh what Xbox is doing with uh, uh yeah. cloud streaming. So like I you know, um maybe uh just adding Switch to that list is uh, an an easy uh proposition when you can line it up with all the other services too and like actually draft some sales off of that. All that being said, I agree with you that this is probably just a mistake. <laughs> Neither of us have play Monster Hunter and we haven't played Monster Hunter Rise, but Patrick really likes Mega Man, so yep. let's talk about Rush coming to Monster Hunter Rise. Um, uh, this is cool. It is just a you know a, a an alternate downloadable costume for the Palamutes, which turned them into Rush, um, the dog from uh, Mega Man. Uh, they they kind of bill it in the trailer as a crossover between Monster Hunter Rise and Mega Man Eleven. Um, which is sort of wild because, you know, Rush has been around since 1990 and Mega Man 3, but yeah, sure, whatever, call out, call out Mega Man 11, why not? Um, and, you know, it doesn't really change any of the functionality of the, of the, the characters or the gameplay, but it sure does make them look like Rush, uh, and I like Rush, so my dumb brain is like, should I, should I play Monster Hunter? <laughs> Uh, it's part of the downloadable Palamute layered armor set, which is available September 24th, so later this week. If you're a Nintendo Switch Online subscriber in North America, you can check out Story of Seasons, Pioneers of Olive Town, this, uh, this week, next week, next week, um, for a limited time. So this is one of the like game trials that Nintendo occasionally does for Nintendo Switch Online subscribers. The game can be played in its entirety with an active Nintendo Switch Online subscription starting on... Oh, no, it is this week. It's on uh, Wednesday. September 22nd. Yeah, yeah, starting September 22nd. And it runs through September 28th at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. I think this is one I'm going to check out. I have, you know, am interested in these Story of Seasons games. Love uh, Classic Harvest Moon. Really love... Uh, Stardew Valley, and so this is one that I'm interested in dabbling in, and this, without having to pay for it, seems like the perfect opportunity to do that. Yeah, this is maybe the smartest one of these that they've done, right? Especially considering how much of the um, Switch audience uh, is there because of Animal Crossing. 
Um, and it's also the, the perfect kind of game that you can let someone play the full version of for a week um, and they will still have so much left to do in the game yeah. and will have you know finally like built up um, a- enough like momentum that they want to keep coming back to it. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, speaking of which, the game I think is on sale right now for 10% off or something like that as part of this promotion. And just because I kind of uh, made a mess of it the first time, to be clear, if you are a Nintendo Switch Online subscriber in North America, Story of Seasons, yep. Pioneers of Olive Town can be played starting on September 22nd, which happens to be this week. Um, and it runs through the end of September 28th, which happens to be next week. Right. It's basically a, a, a super fat weekend, right? Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, it's like a six-day weekend. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, but before we get into our, our, our final news item, uh, I did just want to shout out um, Mick McGinty, uh, who is a, an artist that worked on a lot of um, Street Fighter art for the releases in um, North America. Um, the like Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and Super Street Fighter 2 North American box art. Um, that's, those are painted by him. He was uh, an artist who died last week. Um, and some of those uh, you know, promotional images are just like burned into my brain. Um, he did a lot of cover art for um, Sega as well and uh, uh, other stuff. But like uh, seeing his artwork uh, show up this weekend uh, sort of in uh, memoriam uh, to the artist uh, really like triggered something in my brain where I was like, oh, no, I'm a kid again. <laughs> um, so uh, just just wanted to uh, uh, honor and recognize uh, Mick McGinty. And finally, Pac-Man 99 is getting a free Tank Battalion theme. It's free. Go check it out. Yeah, go check it out. Uh, If you have Nintendo Switch Online, that means you already have Pac-Man 99. Uh, And, you know, they are just sort of gradually adding new free themes to it. Um, Just just like the uh, the cloud version of things, I I wonder if Pac-Man 99 is successful. If people engage with it, if people are playing it, I, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't really either. But again, it goes down, back to like, you know, Nintendo has what, like 20 million Nintendo Switch Online right. subscribers or something. <laughs> right. So even if you're getting a fraction of that, that's, you know, probably more engagement than a lot of games get. Right, right, right. Yes, Nintendo Switch Online is a bigger platform than a lot of hardware. Is. So, yeah. Uh, all right, Mark, uh, let's get out of the news. <laughs> Okay, that is going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts. If you like the episode, you can share it on Facebook or Twitter, wherever you share stuff. Uh, We appreciate it when you do that. You can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell. And collectively, we are at Nincart Society. You can check out the Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Cartridge Society. Why we picked such a hard name to say, Mark. Nintendo Cartridge Society. No, even that was bad. All right. Uh, Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of his music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Ellers connecting to your Bluetooth device and saying thank you for listening. Rachel, do you like Disney movies? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen all of them? Yeah, we saw all the Disney animated movies. And we saw all the Pixar animated movies, too. How about the DCOMs? What? What? The Disney Channel original movies. You should listen to our podcast, Inside the Disney Vault, because we are watching all of them in chronological order. Yeah, and we do fun segments, like we cast each other. That's right, and my favorite segment, Zaddy Watch, where we rank every single DCOM daddy. Ooh, you can listen to all this fun stuff on our podcast, Inside the Disney Vault on Campfire Media, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, guys, let's get back in the vault. It's cold out here. Campfire.